not spoken for three years at the Animal Aid Conference. The last time I spoke was when the Culls were starting in 2013, so here I am three years later, having written a book about the last three years of my life. Uh, Badger to Death is a book about the Badger, of course, but it's a book about people, it's a book about politics, uh, it's a controversial book. Uh, it's a book about three years of my life campaigning against what I think is one of the worst farm environment policies this country has ever seen in 40 years. Um, and the title was chosen because it was provocative, but I think caught the mood in, in terms of what was actually happening to this beautiful protected species across our isles. Now, badgers have lived in our isles for over half a million years. They are a protected species today, but that's only quite recent in terms of the law. Uh, I call it badger to death because badger to death is a phrase that's used in the English language to describe people that are persecuted and driven to death. And it obviously relates to the badger. And that tells you an awful lot about the way we've treated this poor animal over many, many hundreds of years. The badger has no protection under the law until quite recently in the early 1970s. It was a creature that didn't have any royal protection in the way that game birds or deer did in terms of protecting certain parts of the country against poachers, the poorer people trying to, to get hold of the animals and the rich aristocracy wasn't enough. It was largely left to the rural poor to do as they pleased with the animal. So if you look at the 17th and 18th century, for example, there was lots of places across the country, inns, where badgers had been dug out of the ground and were used to fight with dogs. And gambling took place up and down the country where these animals were fought in horrible, horrible, ferocious conditions with dogs until they finally died. When we move forward into the 19th century and the Industrial Revolution, the level of persecution and cruelty to these animals increased rapidly, primarily because of the colliery industry, the huge expansion of coal mining in Britain, in Wales, in Nottinghamshire, in Yorkshire, and other parts of the country. We have hundreds of thousands of men working in the mines in very dangerous, hard working conditions. And at the weekend, when they didn't have time off, a lot of them would take their terrier dogs and go badger baiting. They'd put the dogs down the badger sets to fight with the badgers and kill them, to take the badgers out. And because of the sheer scale of the number of people doing this, from the 19, late 19th century up until the 20s, 30s, 40s, and the post war era, the level of destruction of badger sets was significant. The level of killing of the animals rapidly increased to the point where many conservationists and pioneers like Ernest Neal and others who had worked to really raise awareness of badgers started to raise serious concerns about their protection and their future. And it was in the late 1960s that the first badger protection groups were established in places like Went, in the Wirral and Cheshire. And physically what people did, they actually sat on the top of badger sets at night to stop the baiters coming on to try and kill the animals. And they started to lobby and get organized in Parliament. And this resulted in 1973 in a private member's bill that became the Protection of Badgers Act. So this animal, for the first time, got legal protection, both in terms of destruction of its sex and persecution of the animal itself. That was a major step forward. But at the same time in 1973, unfortunately, the badger stumbled into something else that was not of its own making. It was the rapid industrialization of our livestock and dairy industry where we saw the first rapid expansion of the disease bovine TB in our cattle herds. And what we began to see was the actual disease started to spread outside of cattle into our wildlife. And the badger, unfortunately, started to get infected by cattle. And in 1973, the Ministry of Agriculture vets found a number of dead badgers and tested them in the southwest and found they had TB. And what this suddenly resulted in was a massive shift and a huge blame game from the farming industry and the political classes at the time to say, actually, if we want to get control of bovine TV, all we need to do is start killing the badger. So this demonization process that had gone on over hundreds and hundreds of years, all that baiting and all that cruelty that led to protection, just shifted. So it was no longer the colliery workers that were going to go after the badger. Suddenly it was the farmers. And suddenly they had the support of the politicians to do so as well. And that was an absolute tragedy. And the book really tells the story of why that was so wrong. Because the one thing we really didn't understand is how the disease spread between cats and cats. The one thing we do know from good scientific research is that over 95% of transmission of bovine TB is cattle to cattle. We know that it spreads just like a human disease in damp, 
conditions where we're packed together, be it in damp housing, in poor parts of cities like London and other places around the world where TB was a significant problem, and still to a degree is in many parts of the world, it's no different with animals. You put cattle inside for six, nine months of the year, hundreds of them living sheep by jowl in damp conditions. This is an aerosol spread disease, all that coughing, spluttering, and mucus, that's how it spreads. The badger can get the disease, but it's a result of the cattle spreading it into the environment in which they're living. And the question then is, can the badger easily spread the disease to cattle? And as I mentioned in this book, actually there's little evidence to back that up. There was one study the Central Veterinary Laboratory undertook in Weybridge in Surrey in 1975, where they decided vets working within the Ministry of Agriculture that we must try and find evidence to prove it can spread easily. So they basically took a number of healthy badgers that were captured and they injected them with TB, so they were literally full of the disease and excreting it through their urine and their skin in a very high risk status to other badgers and animals that they might come into contact with. They then created a number of concrete pens with steel doors and roofs across the top and they put those badgers into those pens and then they introduced healthy cars who didn't have TB to live cheek by jowl with those badgers, where those badgers would defecate and urinate in very artificial close conditions to those badgers. And it took six months, six months for the first calf to go down the TV. The second calf in that control system experiment took nine months. And what those vets undertaking that experiment came back with was firstly, actually, in very artificial conditions, it's extremely difficult for a badger, even if it's got a significant level of TV, to spread it to a cat. And this experiment really was seen as not being fit for purpose as a result of that. It didn't show what was likely to happen in the natural farm environment where cows were outside in pasture areas and where badgers, for example, might move across the fields where they were feeding. Yet, there's never been a field experiment undertaken ever since to prove otherwise that there's a problem between transmission routes. Everything that's been done since is mathematical modeling, where we've had an outbreak of TB, where there are badgers in the area, Basically, we're approximating what the risk might be for the badgers spreading the disease to cattle, and then we're basically making a case for killing the badgers. So throughout the 1970s, for example, badgers were removed from large parts of the southwest by cyanide gas, the most disgusting, horrible way to kill these animals. Cyanide gas is pushed down into the, into the sets, but as they're very complex tunnel systems badger sets, it did not move equally around the sets. So the actual gas would not kill all those badgers outright. Some would die outright, some would suffer brain damage, some would move, to other sets and possibly spread the disease if they had it. The cruelty involved was horrendous. And that's when first campaign groups were established, women in particular, handcuffing themselves to trees where some of these badgers were being killed. You can see some of the reports in the local press in the 1970s of this. But this went on for almost a decade. The Zoological Society of London president, Lord Zuckerman, did a review and came back saying he still thought that actually we should be able to gas badgers, even though there might be some questions about its overall. <laughs> animal care and animal welfare issues surrounding it. The only reason that stopped in 1980 is because the weapons laboratory at Portland Down, that does weapons research, actually took batteries and put them into pressure valve tube areas and actually pumped gas into them and actually saw what happened. And it was horrible. The animals screamed and died in the most disgusting conditions. They supplied that video footage and information to ministers who looked at it horrified and thought, oh my god, we can't keep doing this. Peter Walker, the agriculture minister at the time, under Margaret Thatcher, had to go back into the House of Commons in 1980 and admit that it was cruel and it should stop. But the badger culling didn't stop. In the 1990s, it continued. But it was using traps and shooting to kill the badgers, what was called reactive culling. Whenever there was an outbreak of TB, we blamed the badger and go and kill them again. Now, when the Labour government came in in 1997, they decided they needed to review that. And they undertook what was called the randomised badger culling trial. They killed 11,000 badgers, spent 50 million pounds, took eight years to produce the most complex, in-depth, peer-reviewed research undertaken anywhere in the world to prove as to whether badgers could easily spread TB to cattle. And what they found was actually there was no significant evidence that killing badgers would make a meaningful contribution to lowering the, the disease in, in cattle. And actually the best way of dealing with the disease was cattle-based measures. Better TB testing systems, tighter TB controls on movement, and biosecurity. That would do the job. You didn't need to kill badgers. That should have been the end of debate on killing these animals. I should have never had to have written this book. The trouble is that it became political. By the time that particular research was delivered to the House of Commons and the Agriculture Minister at the time, David Miliband, 
we were approaching a general election, 2008-2009. David Cameron, the young leader of the opposition, had decided that he was going to court the rural vote. He needed it to gain all those seats the Tories had lost to get any likelihood of regaining power. And he made clear commitments to the National Farmers Union that regardless of that research, he would put in the manifesto a clear commitment to cull badges. So this became a political issue. The badges paid in blood for rural votes. So by 2010, the commitment was there from the Conservatives, regardless of the science. They didn't get enough to win a majority. They had to go into coalition with the Liberal Democrats. But many Liberal Democrat MPs were based in the southwest of England. They were under significant pressure from the capital and livestock industry to tobacco pellets. So it didn't take much for Nick Clegg and David Cameron in the Rose Garden to sign that deal off and say that goes into the coalition manifesto effectively, where we agree on key issues that work on in government. And that was the death sentence for badges. Over the last four years, from 2013 onwards, the government has been culling both in coalition and now in its own right as a government. Badges in large numbers. We've probably now seen the death of over 10,000 badges in Dorset, Gloucester, Somerset, Devon, and Cornwall. We've spent the best part of £35 million. Pounds. None of the badges have been tested for TB at all because we know they did test them as they found in the randomised badger culling trial. Probably only around 15% were likely to have disease, the rest would be disease free. Many of the badgers have been killed by what's called a free shooting method. But basically they put bait outside a badger set, the badgers come up, and so-called trains marksmen who've had one day training shoot them. And they're meant to shoot them cleanly and quickly. And actually what we found under the government's own independent expert committee, and recently the British Veterinary Association as well, found that that system of killing is very cruel and very ineffective. And actually maybe 10, 15, or 20% or more of those animals could take five or 10 minutes to die of blood loss, organ failure drag themselves off to die. So that's why this book was written, was really to tell the story of how that was so wrong, how the politicization of science, how the vote-winning strategy based upon the blood of a wild animal that was protected was so wrong. But what was so pleasing is the way that people like you in this room reacted to it. You didn't go quiet, you weren't indifferent, you came out onto the streets. We've had over 35 separate marches up and down this country over the last three years against the Badger Club in Brighton, in Leeds, in Manchester, in Chester, we're going to be marching next week. Birmingham, London, all the cities that you can imagine, the towns across this country, the biggest rolling protest of its time. We've had high court challenges, three debates in Parliament, over 330,000 people signing a petition against the policy. We've had people going to the fields to protest, setting up wounded badger patrols in direct action to try and stop this horrible, cruel policy in a way that we've seen nowhere else in the world would happen. But there are a lot of other people to blame for this, not just the farmers, not just the politicians. In the book, I say that the BBC, for example, as a broadcaster, has let the public down in terms of its neutrality as a broadcaster at times on this issue. For example, it interviewed Princess Anne, who talks openly on Country File about the fact that badgers should be gassed, they go to sleep, and they won't feel any pain, which is not true. And as I said earlier on, actually gassing badgers is one of the cruelest things you could possibly do. They put out programs like they did with Hope and Glory, their so-called programs following Country Life, the magazine, over a number of months and of all the issues around the wonderful countryside and the people that feel they own it and have a right to it. The first episode of that was a very, very vindictive attack on badgers, taking farmers in the southwest, one particularly, a chap called Morris Durban, following him as he had his herd inspected for TV and as he became increasingly angry that he was in shutdown, he couldn't sell his cattle and move them, and how he blamed badgers as a result. The statements made in that program about badgers were completely wrong to a large degree. Anger expressed by the farmer was very dangerous because it was giving a green light to illegal persecution. Yet millions of people watched those programs. I'm also very critical in the book about some of the big NGOs as well. At the end of the day, charities like the Badger Trust have fought very hard as small organizations against this policy. But where are the big charities? Where are Greenpeace? Where are Friends of the Earth? Where are WWF? With all their resources, those three charities alone bring over 100 million pounds a year into this country, into the coffers for their work. They do much good work, don't get me wrong. But on this, they've lost the plot. They're not supporting any action of any kind that would protect badgers in the way that all of us, I think, in this room feel they deserve to be protected. They're not funding any other activities, peaceful patrols. They're not funding any more research. They're not lobbying in Parliament. They're not doing the things that their resources and their membership would make a huge difference working with us on. I've also condemned the veterinary industry as well. Because vets should be there. The first priority should be animal welfare. 
Too many vets, I'm afraid, have close financial relationships with the livestock industry and put aside the ethics of killing this wild animal to keep those clients happy. They know that badger culling is cruel. They know that it's ineffective. But they continue through bodies like the British Veterinary Association and the British Cattle Veterinary Association to support it, give succor to the government, and give the green light to the expansion of this type of policy, which is completely and utterly wrong and should not be happening. I blame politicians of all parties because at times we do not stand up enough for wildlife. The badger is a lightning rod about the future of our countryside. The badger today, the buzzards tomorrow, will lose our otters again because there's pressure there. When we do introduce animals like beavers, there's suddenly pressure to destroy them again. Sparrow hawks, I could go on. You're all familiar with the arguments about land, about power, and about protection. And every time there are big debates and discussions in government, it's short-term economic political issues that take priority over protection of species. I was born in 1970. Today, I'm 46 years of age. Over 48% of the species on this planet have declined in my lifetime. Nearly 50% in this country alone. A species that we know, our wildlife, has disappeared in relation to numbers and where we will find them. We cannot go on like this. So this is a lightning rod issue, the badger cut. It's a line to be drawn into the sand. It's to say that actually this is not right. You might not see these animals alive. Most people probably don't have the, the joy and wonder of watching badgers. If you do, it's fantastic. Many only see them dead by the side of the road. But they are terribly important animals. They're beautiful animals. They're protected because of the persecution that they face. And it's not just from badger baiters and badger culling. We have huge pressures because of the green belt expansion and development of property and building development. Up and down this country today, homes are being built. Often, laws are being broken. Badger sets are being plowed over. Because you can make more money building homes and you can just pay off the fines if you have to in relation to the badgers. We have farm owners, land owners. We have hunt masters who want to hunt foxes filling in badger sets so the hounds don't go off the scent. Breaking the law in two places, both the Hunting Act and also the persecution of badgers. This animal has become a lightning rod issue about the future of our countryside and about the future of the species that inhabit it. Badger to death is really a heartfelt plea to say that we should not remain quiet. We must stand up, we must be counted. That we must hold our politicians to account. We must hold our media to account. We must hold those big NGOs that claim they care for the planet to account. We must say to bet you should not be involved in the killing of wildlife. You should be standing up to protect it. And we must be proud as individuals that if we can come together and stand and fight, then we might be able to do something. This world is full of horror from Syria to refugee crisis to global climate change and worries about where our politics might be going from Donald Trump to Brexit and everything else. Often these things envelop us to a degree that we feel we have no power over. But we do have power about our local communities. We do have power over what authorities are doing, what farmers and landowners are doing in the land that we live on. And we should be able to stand up and say enough is enough. Because if we achieve anything, we should be protecting these animals. And the danger is this. If the badger cull continues, we've seen probably 10,000 of these animals killed now. Over the next five, ten years, it could be three, four hundred thousand plus of these animals killed. There is no doubt in my mind that you will see local extinction of badgers from parts of the country where they've lived for half a million years. Gone forever. On the basis of killing them for a disease that will make no difference, we could kill every badger in England and we'll still have TB in cattle. We can solve the disease by working with farmers and landowners that we are. Yes, we can vaccinate badgers who don't have TB against the disease, and that's something that we're doing and we'll continue to do. In time, we should be vaccinating cattle against TB. It's something we should do and we can do. We need to work with farmers to improve the biosecurity on farms, to prevent interaction of badgers and cattle, for example, to make sure that they're using silage and slurry more carefully because it has bacteria in it. When they spread it around the farm, it can spread the disease as well. We must stop this massive trading of cattle. We move more cattle in Britain than anywhere else in Europe. Through markets are often very poorly controlled. We must ensure that the actual vaccination systems for cattle and the testing systems work properly. At the moment, the TB testing system is based on skin test technology from the 1930s. And one in four cattle, on average, do not show up on the test. So even when the farmer thinks he's clear, there are TB cattle in the herd still pumping out the disease. So when they say they have a closed herd, they have to move cattle in, that means nothing if the test isn't working. There is something called gamma interferon blood testing. It's been provided free by the Welsh Government to <coughs> farmers in Wales. 
If you combine it with a skin test, it hugely increases the ability to find the TB reactors and remove them to stop the spread of the disease through the herds. We also must put pressure on the supermarkets to say, you supply us with food, but we should have a right to say how you produce that and what impact it has on wildlife. You shouldn't be just stack it up and sell it cheap and then forget about the consequences. And we shouldn't be exporting live cattle out of a place like Ramsgate all the way across Europe to the Turkish border where they die in filthy hot conditions on lorries just so they can go into halal slaughterhouses when actually if you were going to have an export trade you could at least ensure the animal is slaughtered first and you move the meat, not the animal, in these horrible, horrible conditions. But the fact is we're not vaccinating badgers, well, sorry, cattle, largely to keep that export market open. This is a system of cruelty. And this is something that we must deal with. So if you haven't read this book yet, please feel free to do so. It's a great Christmas read, buy it, send it to your MP, share it with other people. It is selling well. It's wonderful about people like Chris Packham, who's a very good forward for it, giving support to it. It's been great to get some of the national coverage we have. It is provocative, it is controversial. But in my view, it's about time we see more books written, not just celebrating wildlife, but looking at the politics of why they're being killed. Be it badgers here in this country, be it dolphins in Taj in Japan, be it the trophy hunting of lions, or the destruction of elephants for ivory or rhino horn, all the issues that I'm involved with. Wherever I go today, I see animals being killed as a result of ignorance, corruption, and greed. And it's no different to badgers than it is to elephants and lions. And that's why you stop it. Thank you very much.